I bet you'd love to flourish. To flourish as a leader and to flourish as a human being. And that's what we're going to talk about today, part of what we're going to talk about today with our great guest. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to talk about leadership, teamwork, organizational culture, and human potential with experts from every walk of life. Your host is Kevin Eikenberry, a best-selling author and leadership thought leader for 25 years. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's book, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership. Order your copy today at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash book. And now, here's your host, Kevin. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. It's right where you wanted to be. And you definitely want to be here today because we have a great guest today. Her name is Lisa Zagarmi, and I'm going to tell you all about her right now. Uh, Lisa is an organizational psychologist and leadership coach. She helps leaders relate more deeply, decide more effectively, and think more creatively. All of those in favor signify by saying I. Lisa is one of the first 150 people to earn a master's degree in applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. Her coaching is a blend of leadership science, positive psychology, and mindfulness practices. She regularly contributes to Forbes. and Her corporate clients include Salesforce, Saganska, Adidas, and VMware. I may have said that wrong. Lisa coaches leaders from around the globe and is based in Portland, Oregon. And today, she's with me and you on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Lisa, welcome. I'm so happy to be here, Kevin. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. We've been trying to do this for a while and you were not feeling well and couldn't talk. So kind of hard to do a podcast when you can't talk. So I'm glad you're feeling better. And even though you say your voice isn't perfect, it sounds pretty good to me. So I'm glad you're here. And um, so here's where I want to start. I know you have an interesting background. I mean, everyone on the planet has an interesting background. You definitely do. Tell us a little bit about your journey that leads you to where you're at in your personal professional life today? Sure. Well, um, I am the proud product of two organizational psychologists. <laughs> um, so our dinner table conversations were quite interesting growing up. Um, they, they involved a lot of discussions about leadership and philosophy and really the practical applications of both because my parents were um, researching and applying leadership principles in organizations around the globe. So it was, um, it was a precious childhood. And my parents were constantly encouraging me to ask for the vision and the support and the direction I needed from my teachers and my coaches growing up. And it was funny because I think I really was a guinea pig for a lot of the leadership models. that They They weren't telling you that, but that's now you know, right? Yeah, now I know. And so that was the start of my journey um, into the concepts of leadership. And then um, I decided to, to work in the field. I decided to go and get my master's in applied positive psychology from Penn and to really study the science of well-being. Um, the science of happiness. And then I worked alongside my parents in terms of trying to apply those concepts in organizations. So you're like the parent, the, the kid of the two lawyers who becomes a lawyer. I mean, like you are doing the kind of same kind of work that your folks did, which is really very cool. Um, yeah. so, uh, so, so thank you for that. Now, you, you just said it, and I mentioned it in the, in the introduction about the applied positive psychology degree. And people that are listening either have never heard of that and are probably intrigued by that idea. And others may be more like me, like you sort, they know a little bit about the background of that. And so they're saying, man, she's really cool because that's really cool stuff. So either way, regardless of which hat people are wearing as they're listening to me saying all this, tell people a little bit um, about what applied positive psychology means. Uh, and, and yeah, just let's just start there. What does that, what does that mean? So in the 90s, a man named Martin Seligman was the head of the American Psychological Association, and he was a visionary. Martin um, really believed, we call him Marty, um, that 
we had to understand what made life worth living and how people were thriving and flourishing if we were actually going to support well-being across the planet. So psychology has done something really well for about 200 years, and that's to study pathos and human suffering and deficit. And it's really important that we understand that. Marty said, you know, what if we took it from the other side? What if we also studied um, people who were flourishing and we created practices that would help people um, engage that part of their life? So if they weren't depressed and we weren't studying or solving for depression, right. but they were just operating kind of like at a, on a one to 10 scale, they were at a two. He was saying, how could we move them to a five? How could we study people who are at eight or nine and 10 and apply those practices and that learning and that science so that um, everybody's well-being could increase? And yeah, so that's, that's what I'm in. The science of happiness. You said those words. That's sort of one way to look at it. And so Marty, I, I, won't, I can't call him really that because I've only read his books. He's written a number of books. And that's so, so the people that might have had a, a hook to, to that, that, that language earlier would probably recognize some of his books. So for some who don't know, just off the top, give us one, maybe one of his books that people might be interested in. Sure, his seminal work is Learned Optimism. And then his latest book I think is called Flourish. Um, actually, he has one more that's about prospecting theory that's just come out, but I'm, um, it was, I'm it was learned optimism that I was really, I mean, I, I couldn't come up with it in a minute or I would have just done it. That's the one I was thinking. Certainly, uh, great stuff. And I think worth us thinking about as humans, worth us thinking about as leaders. So that leads me to my next question, which is, so anyone who's listening, most of whom are listening are either leaders or they are aspiring leaders. What, what would you say now i know you have a master's degree in this so it's not like you can give us the whole answer in 12 seconds but what what's what's in a practical thing that we ought to know in our work leading others that that they might not know or might not realize that comes from applied positive psychology well we sort of have a formula for human flourishing now um, and I think actually it's not going to be surprising to folks, um, but I hope that it reminds them of the things that they know to be true. Um, here's what we know makes people sustainably well. Um, and I like well-being more than happiness because I think it's not fleeting. It's really about a sustainable sense of presence and contentment. So we know that, um, People who are well express positive emotion. Um, <laughs> it's funny because we don't give a lot of credence to positive emotion, but it's really important. Positive emotion actually expands our mental capabilities. It makes us more creative. It makes us more productive. It makes us less defensive. Um, it makes us more apt to see what's going right in the world and then magnify that rightness. So, so can you stop there for one second? Here's, here's my observation. My observation is that, to your point, everybody internally is agreeing with that. Even the most crusty, you know, whatever person is saying, yeah, that's true for me. And yet they don't want to think about how they would then do that or support that or encourage that or give that to others. It's just such an interesting um, irony to me because I don't think anyone would disagree with what you said. Hey, when I'm when I'm in a more positive frame of mind, when, and when I'm feeling better, I'm more creative. I'm, you know, all of the things you just said, and yet somehow we don't think we should be fostering that in others. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a very small mind shift, which makes this easy for your listeners. Um, positive emotion and expressing it. And I want to talk about what is a positive emotion. There are actually 10. It's awe. It's joy. It's wonder it's love, it's gratitude. Those are, those are positive emotions. When you actually express them, you open your brain neuro pathways up to greater possibilities and you can acquire new skills more easily and you can make connections with others because we're social beings more easily. Um, we call this in, in the science of, of well-being the broaden and build effect. 
Um, so if people just cultivate positive emotions in a three to one ratio at work, if they think about sharing what they're delighted with, sharing what they're grateful for, sharing what's going right, three times more than they share what's going wrong or what's negative, they will start to create the conditions for people to have greater well-being at work. So let's just stay there. And I, I sort of knew when I started this conversation with you that it wouldn't end up where I wrote down and it won't, <laughs> and it's awesome. And so he, here's the question, um, you know, that three to one ratio thing. And in the, in oftentimes people say, well, then we ought to be giving three times as much positive feedback as negative feedback, that is not exactly what you just said. I'd like you to say, how is what you just said the same or different from that other thing I just said that it often gets equated to? I'm talking about expressing positive emotion. Um, and actually, I think that means that we have to legitimize emotion in business, which is a whole nother topic I'd love to talk to you about, Kevin, because I think feelings are the F word in business. Um, but we need to sort of say feeling is as important and as critical as rational thought in everyday organizational life, right? And so we have to make space for people to express positive and negative emotion. But what we're really trying to say right now is how can we gear ourselves towards finding opportunities to express wonder at work? to express love, which most people don't think of at work. I like to think of it as inherent positive regard. Can you show that to another person? Um, that really starts to shape the environments that we work in and create the conditions for flourishing. So that's one piece, Kevin, yep. um, positive emotion. We also know that we're meaning seeking beings. So that's another way that leaders can create the conditions for people to be well at work. They can help people make sense and make meaning of their work. They can help it, they can connect them to how they're contributing to the organization's overall purpose, to the team purpose. And then they can actually ask them to get curious about why their work matters to them. And that's really important. It certainly is. It certainly is. And, and that's a very, you, you, you're, you're speaking to the fact that this is a personal thing, right? It's not like, let's talk about the organizational purpose here, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. And that could be a part of related to this, but it's, it's about this idea of seeking meaning and helping as a leader, as a coach to help people find that. Fair? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. is part of your imperative as a human being on this planet is to find it's, like, it's everybody it's not like she has an has an opinion there no uh, sorry i don't uh, <laughs> <laughs> no it's okay it's okay i love it i, I love it <laughs> go, go ahead i really think that's part of why we're here we are meaning seeking beings we actually we gravitate to story because why because story actually helps us make sense and makes make meaning of our experience we're always writing stories and telling ourselves stories in our head. So I would like to make it explicit and leaders can help people do that at work. And I think it's one of the, the biggest ways that um, they can contribute to a culture that creates the conditions for people to flourish. Awesome. So anything else that you want to say yeah. about that sort of area of flourishing before I, I sort of move us on? I mean, I know we could spend the whole time there. Anything else you want to say there? Two more things that I just think are important if we're talking about the formula for well-being, right? So we talked about expressing positive emotion and we talked about seeking meaning. I think the other two things people need to know about are people have to feel competent or masterful in something. Um, we know that that you can create the highest levels of well-being when you're in flow. And flow is this beautiful intersection between um, where your skills meet a challenge, right? And you're really engaged. Um, and we've all felt that probably at moments in our lives. Even if it's not at work, maybe it's in parenting, or maybe it's while you're doing your favorite hobby or sport. 
Um, so to the extent that leaders can help people identify what they're good at and then align those individuals with challenges and problems to be solved. Absolutely. We're going to create the conditions for people to be engaged. So I want to want to just think about that. And then the last thing is people need other people. Actually, probably more than anything else I've just mentioned, we know that relationships matter. So if you're not cultivating positive relationships in your life, and if you don't see that as your job as a leader, then you're missing the target in my mind. And if you're not trying to do it, you're not doing it. Like it's not happening by happenstance. It doesn't happen by default. It happens by design. Yep. So where can you really lean in to building positive relationships? Um, and that can be done with your clients, with your employees. Um, but it's really important um, toward, to people feeling like they belong. Um, and also to feeling like you're really connected and can further your own agenda with the help and support of others. Yep. So I'm going to shift gears now um, because you, uh, I, you know, you are a leadership coach and uh, some people who are listening or perhaps watching, but most of if you're listening, you may have had one or you may have heard of one or mm -hmm. know they exist. Um, so my question is sort of, what is your approach to coaching? Um, what is it that you feel like is important about the role of being a coach? And how did you come at that yourself? Great question, Kevin. Um, that's, the, that's what coaches do, ask good questions. They do ask good questions. Um, I am fascinated by who people are at the moments of leadership. And I want people to be as wakeful as possible to themselves and to their influence and to their impact on the world. So I try to help people, um, as you said, when we opened the, the podcast here, I try to help them relate more deeply, decide more efficiently, and think with more creativity. And um, there are sort of four things I look at when I'm working with a client. Okay. The first one is, where are you putting your attention? Where are you focused right now? Um, because what we know is that where you put your attention is what you create in the world. So if you're putting your attention on a lot of non-essential tasks, you're probably really creating inconsequential outcomes. And I want my clients to be creating meaningful outcomes, and they want that too. So... I help clients look at where are you putting your attention? Where are you focused? Another thing I ask my clients is, um, where are you walking towards the things you'd rather avoid? Where are you being courageous? Um, and a lot of times they can't answer that question, right? Because they are avoiding things. They know they need to have a difficult conversation. They know they need to make a move, but they're afraid to do it. Um, so we look at that because leadership takes courage um, and self-awareness takes courage. And I'm in the game of both of those, leadership and self-awareness. So before you go on to the third of your four questions, first of all, I want to make two observations. One is that notice the way she's describing her approach is by asking questions, which in and of itself should tell you a lot about the way that she goes about it. I think it has a lot to do with how I believe coaching ought to be done as well. But the other thing, since you just mentioned courage, I just tell anyone, especially if you're a newer listener, that we had Bill Treasurer on who wrote the book, The Courageous Leader. We had Bill way back, I think episode number seven. So if you're, if you're listening and you didn't hear that one and that sort of struck a nerve for you, you might go back and listen to, listen to Bill Treasurer. But get, go on now to our, you've told us about, um, about two of the four things. Where's our attention? Where's our focus? Uh, where are we being courageous? What's next? Next is, where are you enduring? Where are you leaning in? Where are you sustaining effort that you know you need to, right? A lot of times when things get uncomfortable and hard, we want to eject. But leadership is, it's a marathon, right? So if you're ejecting at mile five or you're ejecting at mile seven, you're not actually able to feel 
the rewards that come from mile 26.2. Right. Well, and you're not even there for your folks either, right? You're not there for your folks. So where are you intentionally sustaining effort is one of the questions I ask my clients so that they recognize that that's really important, right? And that they get to choose. They get to be agents of whatever is uncomfortable in their life right now. They get to relate to it a little differently. Perfect. Well, the last question I ask is, what have you let go of recently? Um, I think letting go is probably the most unexamined skill of leadership. Um, and I ask that of all my clients because it tells me where they're growing. The skill of letting go is essential because it makes space for learning and for greater impact. And a lot of leaders that I encounter, they don't want to let go because to them it looks like giving up control or it looks like surrendering an identity that they've spent a long time cultivating. I can't let go of that because that's <laughs> no, who I am, I right? That. I can't let go of the idea of being an expert in this technical field, but yet my job now is to lead and steward experts, yeah. right? Yeah. So I really talk a lot about or like to ask my clients to look at the skill of letting go, which is really a skill. Um, so, how do we build, so how do we build that skill? Oh, well, um, you engage new possibilities, I think, um, consistently. But I, there are five strategies that I think my leaders have taught me over the years helps, let, helps people let go, right? Um, the first is to understand that it doesn't look like walking out um, or giving up right? It looks like intentionally deciding that a new behavior or belief is appropriate. So you have to change your frame of reference around what letting go is. The next thing is, and this isn't rocket science, I'm sure a lot of your guests have spoken about this, you have to cultivate some level of mindfulness. So I think that you can get there through meditation, right? Directing your energy, directing your focus away from worry and anxiety towards possibility right? Because a lot of people get worried, oh my God, I'm going to let go of this and then what's going to happen? I want you to think about what's going to happen only, right? right? Um, the next thing I think is seeing the universe as friendly. Like we want leaders to be critical thinkers, but we don't want them to be cynics, right? We don't want them to be so skeptical that they can't believe that there aren't other possibilities out there that they can't see. Right? So I want them to see the universe as friendly. When you do that, you know, new connections, new people, new possibilities show up and you have some confidence around letting go. So I just want to stop right there for a second because you just made a statement that is probably worth everyone who's listening to hit the pause button and think about it for a second. Not that there haven't been several of those. You said, see the universe as friendly. Yeah. And I think that, you know, a lot of times, you know, we talked about applied positive psychology and you know, it's not just positive thinking or optimism, although that's, you know, the, we talked about Martin's book, a learned optimism, but, but I think that's an important phrase, especially for people who don't sort of lean in the direction of being optimistic, which I will admit I do. Right. So I don't have trouble with those other words in my own head, but I think that phrase is so when I think about some of the folks that I've worked with, some of the people that I know, some of the people that I've coached and had conversations with, I think that phrase in and of itself, I think is so powerful. See the universe as friendly. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to, to underline that for everyone else and, and give you a little, a little positive feedback on it because I think it's great. I think it's absolutely great. I can't take credit for that. You know who well, said it? You can. It's fine. No, you know who said it is our main man, Einstein. So he said... The most basic question that people must answer for themselves is, is the universe a friendly place? And his belief is that people that see the universe as unfriendly, they isolate themselves and they build walls and protection, right? If people believe the universe is, is you know, indifferent, then luck is their only ally right? And they lose agency and life really loses meaning. But if people believe that the universe is friendly, 
they use their natural resources and their tools and their discoveries for the common good. So I think it's and they're much more proactive because why wouldn't I be? Because it's right. Yeah, it, it's it's noticing what's right is as long in your life, right? And it's um, it's really important, I think, in terms of finding the confidence to let go because you're not always looking for what is wrong or dangerous. So we're talking about how to help us let go. You've given us three and I stopped you. I interrupted you. I apologize. But so there's two more. What are those other two things? There's two more. Um, we talked about this earlier, pursue positive emotions. Um, we know that that's going to help you let go because you're going to be able to engage new possibilities and new knowledge and new skills. A big one is you've got to depersonalize. Work is a reflection of who you are, but it's not all that you are. So over identifying with a position makes it harder for you to let go. So work is really personal, but it's not meant to limit you. So I would love it if, if leaders could discern, right? Where, um, where to attach, right? And where to let go. And you don't need to attach to the ego part. So depersonalizing, I think, is a real big key to letting go and to seeing that there are other possibilities, other ideas. And the last thing is, you know, develop others. Um, if you're always the savior, <laughs> if you're always um, the person that is saving your team, then you're sending a message to them that they need to be saved. But people really want to self-develop and self-direct. Right. And you can't, so, you can't let go if you feel like not you're not willing to do it, right? If you're not you're willing not to develop, you can't, you can't get out of the cycle, even if you want to, yeah. which is what oftentimes people will say, well, I want to. Well, your behavior says something else, right? And you're giving us some, some tactical things that we can do to, to start to think about that differently, because that's where oftentimes people get stuck. They say, yeah, I want to do that. I, want to, I need to move on. I do, do different stuff. So, well, your behavior is not saying that, because your behavior says, I'm staying right here. Being yeah. the I'm being the expert, right? So where can you let someone else shine and where can you develop them so that you can get out of the way and go engage new things that are going to grow you? And therefore the rest of the team and the business or the organization, right? Completely. So, uh, so okay. I've got one, one word you've said several times that I want you to talk about briefly before we start, we move into a new phase of the conversation. You've used the word wakeful. I'm sure everyone listening has heard the word mindful, and you've also used that word. Are they synonyms, or what do you mean by wakeful? Oh, that is such a good um, question that I'm going to try not to bring too much of a spiritual lens to. Um, wakeful is remembering that we all have an interconnection. It's remembering that um, we can be present to what is in front of us um, and that we get to choose how we wanna show up. We get to choose some of the things I talked about earlier. Can I express positive emotion? Can I make meaning of this situation? Can I show people that I care about them? Can I find an opportunity for my gifts to meet what the world needs and get into flow? Um, and so that's really what I think wakeful is. It's sort of saying, um, it's my job here to show up and be present to the possibilities in my life. Awesome, thank you. So we're gonna shift to what we call the fast break, Lisa. And the fast break, for all, all those who have listened before, know that it is brought to you by our new book, the long distance leader. So if you are a leader of a team that's remote, or if you have one person on your team who is remote, therefore you are a long distance leader, you might want to check it out and you can learn more by going to longdistanceleaderbook.com. Now the fast break, Lisa, is I have three ideas. It happens to be four words today. It was three ideas. I'm going to share the idea. I just want you to give you your sort of your first thoughts, sentence or two. What, what would you, how would you, how would you react or how would you define or what are your thoughts about that idea? Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. First word is accountability. Necessary. Okay. Second one, time management. 
If you don't value your time, you're never going to be happy. And the last one is strategy. Life happens by design, not by default. All right. Awesome. Thank you. You passed with flying colors. Thank you for that. Uh, I have just a couple that more was questions. Harder than I thought, Kevin. I'm sorry? That was harder than I thought, actually. Well, you know, I, I, I got I to make it hard on you all somehow um, because you do it so effortlessly all the rest of the time. Uh, so here we go. Um, what do you do for fun? I know you have dogs because you said you had to close the door so they wouldn't bark. Uh, yeah. what, do you, what do you do for fun, Lisa? So um, I, I hike with my two French bulldogs, which sounds odd to people because they are not seen as the most athletic dogs. But um, I spend a lot of time in nature with my husband. That really brings me alive and connects me to, I think, the wisdom that's available to all of us. Um, what else do I do? I, I'm in the process of um, piloting a podcast myself, Kevin, that's about self-care rituals that help us all be free. So I'm having a really fun time talking to people about the practices in their life that help them be who they want to be. Um, so that's great. One of those practices for me is yoga. So I um, also spend some time, you know, in Downward Dog and many other asanas, many other shapes. Um, what else? I, I love to entertain and have people over that, that gets to that positive relationship, uh, condition that we talked about for flourishing. So well, I'd be worried if it was only your husband and the dogs, right? So you no, no. So, I love, I love to go deep with, with some close friends. All right. Awesome. And so what, uh, as I ask all wise, uh, discerning people that I meet, I like to know what they're reading. So what's something that you are reading or have read recently that um, you might share with everybody? Yeah, please run, don't walk to get this book. It's called The Four Virtues of a Leader by Eric Kaufman. And a lot of the wisdom that I talked about today in terms of how I approach coaching and the questions that I ask come from that book. I think he's um, a seminal thinker in our field of leadership and mindfulness. And um, I couldn't, I couldn't endorse his, his book further. So. There you go. The four virtues of a leader. So now um, you said you've got a podcast, you got all the stuff that you're doing. How can people find you? Uh, where can people learn more about you, get connected with you? Where do you want to point people? Um, people can always check out what I'm up to on my website, which is just lisazagarmi.com, L-I-S-A-Z-I-G-A-R-M-I.com. Um, my latest sort of Forbes articles are there. Uh, links to my podcasts are there. So it's a one-stop shop. Perfect. We can find whatever we want. Your writing, your, your, your thinking, your podcasting, everything can be found right there, lisazagarmi.com. Tom, that's fantastic. So now I have a question for everybody else. I'm done asking questions of Lisa. My question for all the rest of you is now what? What are you going to do with what you just heard? I, I, it's been a while since I took as many notes during one of these podcasts as I did today. So the question would be, what did you take that you found interesting? Fine. What are you going to go do? What action are you going to take as a result of this? What are you going to try? What are you going to investigate? Uh, maybe you're going to go pick up a book. We've talked about two or three today. Uh, whatever that might be, our, my encouragement, and I, am hope, I believe that Lisa's urging would be as well, that you have to take action. It's not just about information here. It's about application. So I hope that you will do exactly that. And so, Lisa, thank you for being here. Thank you for getting over that bronchitis so we can have this conversation. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much. Kevin, thank you for having me. Thank you for asking such insightful questions that help people advance their consciousness. I appreciate it. You're very welcome, Anna. Hey, thank all of you for being here. And we're here every week. And so come back again next week, if you will. If, you have, if this is your first time, well, we hope it's not your last. And if you're here regularly, we're glad that you're here. And every week, we're right here with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. 